one of the first questions that come to mind when anyone is met with the CPDI Africa mission is, um, one, what are these practices that we are going to return to? Um, what did they look like? How did they function? What's brought about these wonderful architectures that we see in the hub every time we visit? <clears throat> so the, that's the purpose of this um, presentation. The presentation is meant to um, educate on some of the basic practices that were done in the pre-colonial times. And um, it's very general and a bit too general and doesn't go particularly into the specifics of every single ethnic group. It um, generalizes between Southern and Northern communities and just gives a very simple overview of the ideology that our ancestors employed when it comes to land. Okay, so how people nowadays think of land, they think of it as a factor of production. Land is something upon which you build your business. Land is something upon which you may build a house. Maybe you would farm on it again for business, but it's always with like either, mostly the end result is a financial gain or just shelter. However, this was not so in pre-colonial times. In pre-colonial times, land was seen as a gift given by the ancestors to the current generation, and the current generation were going to hold it in trust and then give it as a gift to the future generation. They had deep sentimental relationships with the land, and um, no individual, like, there was no such thing as individual hand hold, land holding. Every single parcel of land was owned by a group, be it a town, a village, a community, or a family. It was always owned by a group of people who equally shared the land together and took care of it together. And land was also very rarely ever owned by strangers to that group. So. These groups are usually very tight limits. Regional differences. Um, southern communities, especially the evil community, view land as a spiritual gift. Land is seen as a gift from the celestial god to the god of the earth, who then holds it to, to the god of the earth to hold it in trust for the people. So um, land is spiritually revealed. It's, it's also held in importance because it gives the people shelter. It sheltered their families from the past and will shelter their families in the future. Land, oh land is also it's spiritually revered. It is used for economic um, it's for um, economic gain because it is upon this land that they found. But again, not only for economic gain, people recognize that the land fed them, the land protected them, the land housed them, and the land would continue to do so for their love, for their future loved ones. So it was very, it was very important to them. In the north, um, in the night, since the Islamic Revolution um, had already been ruling them for hundreds of years, um, they did not have a particular spiritual connection to the land. However, they had a very deep familial one because still their families held an interest for them and they continue to do so for the future generation. And that practice is continued to today because a lot of northern communities are very strict with who they give access to their land to, and it takes a, a lot for them to alienate it to an outsider or to sell it for financial gain. In the communal land, the members have certain rights because since it is unlike the current way of holding land where an individual can hold it 
and they are already prescribed ways for how a group could order. Um, right. They have their own set of rules. Everyone had a right to a portion of the land. There was no pre ascertained portion of the land, but everyone did have a everyone did have a right to a portion of the land. And considering this, no one could take so much that another member of the community or another member of the group could not enjoy this land. Every person had a right to a share of income derived from the land since they all own the land in equity. No one person could extract income from the land without the inclusion of others, unless it is so um, specified. And everyone had a right to participate in the management of the land, seeing as they all hold the land together in equity. There should be no decision that can be made without like everyone's consideration and these rights exist and these rights also existed within a family land seen as the family land was just a smaller community that owned them and now on to family land when we say family land we have to personally consider what family because families have many different sizes and many different classifications you could consider a nuclear family you could consider an extended family so it's like what family is like particularly spoken about when we're talking about family. And even um, before um, the population became much bigger, there used to be something called lineage land where everyone from the same ancestor were living upon the land that he had cleared for them. But nowadays, um, then, sorry, not nowadays, but then later on, it became smaller units of the same lineage holding their own land. So in Chinese versus Masi in 1989, a family was decided to compose of a man, his wife or his wives, and the children born to him from said wives. However, because of many different complications and just the ambiguities of life, this definition can be a bit Restriction, restriction. So other people have decided to, other people have decided to define a family as um, a family land as belonging to a family, all born from a common, usually male ancestor. A lot that resembles the definition of lineage land. Um, family land, as I said, is usually kept to like a smaller number of people. And then there is the very highly regarded definition as given by Chief Ulysses Rodovu, where he said that a family man belongs to a vast family of which many are dead, few are living, and countless members are born. This brings us back to the, the ideology that constantly rules Costa Maryland practices, that this land has housed and this land has fed and this land belongs to the many dead that lived upon it before and it will continue belonging to the many people who are going to continue and this idea and this ideology supposes and suggests that the people we should the people are incredibly adamant in their remaining on this land and not leaving and not going out and um, fulfilling their ancestors' requests for them to continue living in this land. In the context of in the context of customary land ownership, the family is regarded as a corporate entity having perpetual succession. Again, they will continue having. They are expected to, or they will continue to have children who are going to inherit this land. Um, so one thing to consider in family land, just like so another thing to consider in community, in land owned by community is that there is a head who is regarded as holding the land and trust for the many members of the group, and this head um, is usually the representative in business transactions and, and decisions 
However, this head is not expert. It does not have a superior right to the land over other members. This head cannot act in any way that the other members do not do not approve of or do not or do not like or will not enjoy or will not benefit from. The head is expected to serve the members of the family and only just to merely represent them. Family land is constituted an emblem of identity for the well being and growth. This is true, you know, as I said many times before, this is something that the ancestors lived upon and it's upon this land that they would create and contribute to the culture that shapes you. To today, it's upon this land that they practice their rituals that you practice today. It's upon this land that they did their marriages, their funerals, their birthdays, their sacred and spiritual um, ceremonies. The land is in, is intrinsic to cultural identity, and that was so that was part of the reason why it was held in such high regard. Family cannot be forcibly alienated from the land, and no member of the lineage may be without land. Being unhoused or being homeless is something that is very new when it comes to being accepted. In the olden days, a person could not be without land because um, the people were not so wicked as to leave someone completely helpless, except they had committed an atrocity against the land. However, therefore, in family land, a family member could not be without a place. A family member could not be without a land upon which that they could rest and that they could eat from. Everyone was spread around. Everyone enjoyed. Certain people did not enjoy well if a member of the same family remained in abject poverty or destitution. That was just not done. It was... Again, communal, community, togetherness, carrying along, equity. These are the these are the values that shapes the um, these are the values that shapes um, communal and um, communities. And these are my um, sources. These are the texts that I read to contribute to this. Presentation and these are not my only sources of information. I also ask questions. I ask friends to ask their families questions to get a more direct and true um, perspectives. Thank you. Mm -hmm.